Hey friends, this is Surabhi Veach, the Passionate Physio, and I'm going live to talk about postpartum sex and why five reasons why your orgasms are weaker or worse, or why it's more difficult to achieve an orgasm post um, postpartum after you've had a baby. And remember, all of these things can apply to people who've never had a child too. But this is specific to people who are postpartum just because there are some things that are in particular more um, this live before my battery dies. Hi, hi friends. So pop in your questions, especially if you have, I know this is a personal topic, but if you have weaker orgasms or if you're having trouble have, having really good orgasms, if you're finding it takes a long time, if it takes an hour, if it takes a really long time to achieve an orgasm, pop your questions in. We're going to get started with five reasons why orgasms are worse post kids. So number one, you're trying to stifle your voice. You've got a baby sleeping next door. You just put them down. They're finally asleep and you're like, I don't want to wake them up. So you're trying to be really quiet and check this out. Research actually shows that many women, so vulva owners, don't actually vocalize when they're orgasming. They vocalize, you know, the moans, the screams, they vocalize for the egos to help their partners, their male partners feel good about themselves. And so when I found this out, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. But it makes sense because this is what we're kind of socialized to do through media, through movies, um, through, you know, what we absorb through you're a good informative person because it's personal. Well, listen, you know, this is twofold, right? A lot of us vocalize louder. There's research that shows that women vocalize loudest when their men are about to orgasm because it's um, erotic for men. And so that helps them orgasm. And there's many, many reasons why people might do this. It could be because they're bored of the sexual encounter and they're like, all right, I'm done. It could be just because they know that it turns their man on. And I'm talking about heterosexual, cis heterosexual relationships, but this could also apply to um, you know, female, female, male, male relationships, or, you know, whatever combination for non non-binary folks as well. But if you are used to moaning, if you're used to sex, having sex in a certain way, then suddenly you have a baby in the house or sleeping in your bed or sleeping in a bassinet next to you. It makes sense that if you're changing the way you are performing during sex, not even performing, but you are actively participating during sex, then that may affect your orgasm. Maybe you like moaning and freeing your voice. Maybe that helps you feel good. Because the other thing that happens when you're totally stifling your voice and you're just like quiet, when there's a relationship between your epiglottal diaphragm, your diaphragm is your breathing muscle and it sits right here around your rib cage. And when you are holding holding back your emotions, holding back your voice, staying quiet. Maybe your partner is doing something that feels irritating or feels annoying or doesn't even feel pleasurable, but you're just holding your voice in because that's what you've been socialized to do or because you don't wanna you know, disrupt the mood or hurt feelings. What happens when you hold your voice shut is you're also, the what's happening to your epiglottal, your vocal, basically your vocal cords, your diaphragm up here, happens and mimics what happens to your diaphragm, your breathing muscle down here. Also mimics what happens to your, so your pelvic diaphragm down here in your pelvic floor. So if you're staying quiet, essentially what can happen is your pelvic floor muscles can also stay shut or stay tense or hold tension. And when your muscles are holding tension, it's very hard for them to have a nice strong contraction, which is what you need for sustaining arousal. The superficial pelvic floor muscles essentially help with the clitoris, which is this big, helps with clitoral erections. So it helps you stay more aroused. And if some of these muscles are weaker because they're constantly doing this and they can't relax to form a good contraction, that can then impact the strength of your arousal, strength of your orgasms as well. So twofold. You may moan, you may vocalize during sex for the sake of your partner, but at the same time, you may also do it for yourself because it feels good, because you like to let it out. You like to feel so present in your body during sex, and that is a good thing. But when you have a young baby next door that you don't want to wake up, or you have kids sleeping next door that you don't want to wake up, you can be stifling your voice. So what I recommend is turn on some music, turn on, do it in the bath, like, you know, turn on the shower, 
and let yourself be free because constantly holding back your voice, holding back your tension, holding back your voice impacts what's happening in your pelvic floor too. And that can impact your orgasms. That's something that a lot of people don't actually know. And that's something that changed for me postpartum because I was used to making noise and suddenly you've got a kid in your bed or next door. And I'm telling you, my kids are sensitive sleepers. Like I would walk past my kid's room and then they would wake up. And I didn't want them to wake up when you finally get them down to bed and you're exhausted. So I get it. But at the same time, you also need your own pleasure. Hey friends. Hey Jane, pop in your questions, your comments about orgasms, um, postpartum sex, right? So we talked about vocalizations, why they're important, but why they're also, we don't want to exaggerate ourselves and you know, we're not porn stars. All right. If you like making that kind of noises, go for it, but you also don't have to fake it. Be present in your body and vocalize in the way that feels authentic to you. Um, point number two, your pelvic floor muscles may have injuries from childbirth or surgeries. You know, a lot of, there's many, many reasons why you might or trauma. And so when some of the superficial pelvic floor muscles have had any injuries or even the deeper muscles, it can cause pain. It can also impact the ability for your clitoris to get aroused. So think about this little nubbin, right? This little glands, it gets erect when you uh, are aroused. And if the superficial pelvic floor muscles that insert into the clitoris, they're injured, then your erection can be impacted by that too. So that might also impact your orgasm. Don't worry though, if you have had injuries or sustained injuries or surgeries, you can get treatment for that. See a pelvic floor physical therapist. Um, I work with people virtually. You can book a free call and see if working together virtually is a good fit for you. There's tons of amazing people who work um, in person as well, I have a directory through the link in my bio. That's a melanated pelvic floor physical therapy directory. So go check it out and find support for yourself, especially if you're postpartum, you sustain birth injuries or have a prior history of trauma. Point number three, you're holding your breath. Hey, Takesha, we're talking about five reasons why your orgasms are worse postpartum. We've gone over vocalizations, why they may or may not impact how present you feel in your body, how um, involved and turned on you feel. We've talked about birth injuries and pelvic floor muscle injuries. Now we're going to talk about breath. So if you're holding your breath or you're breathing really shallow during sex, you're essentially starving your muscles of oxygen, right? Think about it. If you're running a hundred kilometer or hundred meter dash, you can kind of breath hold, short breathe, and you're finished in what, 15 seconds, right? Unless you're like super fast. But if you're running a five kilometer race, you can't be breath holding and shallow breathing the entire time. The same goes for sex. Unless your orgasm is like 10 seconds or from start to finish, your whole sexual encounter is 10 seconds, then fine, hold your breath. But if you are having sex for 10, 20, 30 minutes, you want to breathe. You want to get that oxygen into your body because that's going to stimulate better pelvic floor muscle contractions. That's going to also stimulate better oxygenation, better um, circulation, right, through your pelvic organs. Um, and then what happens too when you're shallow breathing, your diaphragm, again, going back to that breathing muscle that sits up here around your rib cage, whatever's happening with your diaphragm tends to mimic what's happening with your pelvic floor. So if you're shallow breathing, that, that diaphragm doesn't have that nice rhythmic down and up movement. It kind of stays in the middle. Same thing happens with your pelvic floor. We want the pelvic floor to open and close. We want that nice rhythmic muscular contraction as we lead up to an orgasm, which, which is, is essentially more sustained repetitive pelvic floor muscle contractions. That's not going to occur if you're always holding your breath. And when I say, you know, when I ask people, do you think you're holding your breath during sex? They're like, no, no, no. But then I ask them, do you think you're holding your abs in? You're sucking in your gut. And then they're like, yeah, I feel kind of self-conscious. So I feel like I'm kind of holding everything in, right? And this can happen postpartum. This can happen at any point. And this is, <laughs> there's a big problem around this essentially because we are socialized to believe that our bodies are meant to look a certain way and they are it's false our bodies are meant to be whatever shape size uh, appearance that they are and learning to cultivate self-love in your bodies 
no matter what it looks like, is an important skill. I'm holding a workshop this Thursday in two days to help you reclaim your pleasure, right? And we're gonna practice self-love, we're gonna practice body acceptance, and we're gonna just practice finding presence in our bodies, not worrying about what we look like, but worrying about, not even worrying, but just enjoying what we feel like. And so cultivating self-love and body acceptance, no matter your size, shape, is an important part of sex because when you feel like you have to hold everything in all the time, it's really difficult for you to receive pleasure, to be open to achieve, receiving pleasure. So my tip for you to is to take nice breaths, soft breaths. It doesn't have to be like, <gasps> like gasping breaths. Take nice breaths, especially as you're getting closer to orgasming so that your body has the the energy and the oomph left in it for a nice sustained repetitive muscle contractions leading up to orgasm. All right, we've got two more points to go over and this is in regards to your pelvic floor itself. You can have a pelvic floor that's too tense. Now, why would your pelvic floor muscles be too tense, especially postpartum? So most people who have a vaginal birth, they assume everything's loose and floppy. And while for a certain period of time, maybe that's true, the opposite can also happen. You can have a pelvic floor that's not just loose and floppy, um, but you can have a pelvic floor that's holding too much tension. So think about it this way. You have a baby, whether it's vaginally or through cesarean, you're walking around, you're lifting weights, but your muscles are still in recovery mode. What happens to muscles when they're in recovery mode and then you keep using them? using them over and over again. They can get kind of tired, fatigued, and they can feel a bit sore. They can, you can even rely on a pelvic floor that's too clenched in order to do lifting. So you're lifting your babies up off the floor, your muscles are fatigued, so you just clench everything up to lift your baby up. On the flip side, stress can also create an environment where your pelvic floor is constantly tensing up, right? So who here, whoever is hanging out here still, uh, let me know. Who is, who feels stressed at some point in their day, day to day? You know, I'll raise my hand. Almost every day I go through some kind of stressful situation. Not, nothing, nothing big. Sometimes it's just your child throwing a tantrum when you're tired and you're like, all right, let's go. Uh, it's bedtime. Or, you know, there's micro little bits of stress through our days. And sometimes you can have bigger stressors in your life. Maybe uh, a really serious illness or death in the family or something really bad happened at work and, you know, or <laughs> the news, you know, in, in the real world, there's bad things happening that creates this situation or this environment that creates a lot of tension, hey friends, in your body. And so when you're holding chronic tension, that can also relate to what's happening in your pelvic floor. It's very difficult to have a good orgasm, orgasm if your pelvic floor cannot relax. Because when your pelvic floor is always clenched, imagine your fist is always like this and then you're trying to catch a ball, you gotta open your hand first to catch that ball. So think about that ball like pleasure, right? You wanna open and relax so that you can receive that pleasure. If you're always closed off and clenched, it's gonna be, first of all, sex might feel, intercourse specifically may feel painful, and then going beyond that, it may be hard for you to achieve a nice, strong orgasm. It might, you might have a good orgasm, but it might be really, really short, or you might have an orgasm that's weaker than you're used to. So relaxing that pelvic floor is really important. During my workshop on Thursday, we're gonna be going over specific movement strategies, mobility exercises, stretches and drills that you can do prior to sex, or even every day you can incorporate some of these stretches into your pelvic, um, in your, into your bedtime routine to help you create space and create a nice open environment, a relaxed environment to receive pleasure, right? In whatever way you, you seek pleasure. I always say pleasure is more important than the actual orgasm. Orgasms are, are one type of pleasure. Pleasure is can exist outside of sex as well, right? Pleasure might be a warm hug. It might be your partner making you your morning coffee. These are really important things to talk about as well because when you feel loved throughout your day, when you feel loved outside the bedroom, then that feeling that those happy feelings can translate inside the bedroom. I just did a story today. I shared in my stories how important it is to develop that communication skill outside the bedroom as well so that you can ask for what you want from your partner um, in the bedroom as well. Not just, you know, not just say, oh, I don't want to hurt their feelings. So I'm not going to ask for what I want because that might hurt them. Your partner wants 
well, a good partner will want to give you pleasure, right? So they want to know what turns you on and what feels good. And if they're, if they're doing something that doesn't feel good, it's important to communicate that. Remember that um, sex, especially with a partner, takes two or you know, however many partners you have, it takes multiple people. So it's not just you doing your exercises, it's also how will your partner help if you have pain with sex? How, what are they gonna do to help with that situation? For example, you can ask for a butt massage, a thigh massage. You can ask for a full body massage so that you feel more relaxed and less clenched so that you're more likely to get in the mood. Um, I always say don't rush foreplay, right? Foreplay needs to last at least. There's no perfect time, but give it half hour. Give it a good half hour of foreplay. Don't touch anything in the pelvis. Just work on stuff outside. Remember, pleasure is an all body experience. Don't just go right away and attack the clitoris. There's so much else erotic, um, erogenous zones all over your body that you can experience uh, pleasure at. Okay, we're gonna go to the last point. Um, any questions or comments, you can just pop it in the DM, or not in the DMs, in the, in the, the comment box here. Um, I appreciate all of you all who've kind of popped in, and um, we're gonna go over our last and our fifth point. But remember that we are going to practice movement strategies on Thursday, February 23rd. That's this Thursday at 8.30 p.m. We're going to go over movements that help you open up to receive more pleasure, to reclaim your sexual self, to boost your self sexual confidence, um, and to release the negative self-beliefs that you have about your body, about sex in general. Um, we're going to create this really beautiful, beautiful space together, and I'm so excited for it. Okay, so the last point that can relate to weak orgasms, and this is the one that's most obvious that everyone thinks of, is a weak pelvic floor, right? We all think that our orgasms are weak because our pelvic floor muscles are weak. And that is one of the five reasons. And there are many other reasons, by the way. I just shared five. There are many other reasons as well. Your pelvic floor might be weak. It might lack coordination, right? Maybe let's look at a different example. I might be able to throw a ball, but coordinating it to throw it to my partner that requires a different type of uh, skill. It's not just the strength to throw it that far, it's also the coordination to throw it there. Same thing with your pelvic floor. It's not just strength that you need, it's also the coordination of the muscle contractions. It's also the coordination of you in whatever position that you are in when you're having sex. And it's also the endurance. Maybe you're really good for the first like five minutes and then your muscles get tired and then you're like, I'm done. I, I can't go on top, I can't be, you know, on hands and knees, doggies tell you're like, I just need to be in missionary, I need to lie down on my back. And that's okay too. But if your endurance and your pelvic floor muscles are weaker than they need to be, then they might not be able to hold that clitoral erection as long, right? We all know about erectile dysfunction in dysfunction in men, but we need to talk about clitoral dysfunction too. And maybe that's not the exact same term in women, but or in vulva owners, but there are many reasons why women may not be able to hold their arousal for as long. Why you know you can't last as long when you're feeling aroused and you're feeling nice and wet and lubricated. So, improving your cardiovascular fitness can be one thing. Your pelvic floor fitness, your endurance. During my workshop on Thursday, we're going to be doing some moves to help boost your booty, your inner thighs, your pelvic floor, so that you start to feel a little bit more connected to yourself and in your. Uh, to your pelvic floor, I want you to feel some nice tingles, some buzzes. I want you to feel alive down there. Um, whether or not you have a partner, whether or not you've had a baby, we all deserve pleasure. Pleasure is your birthright. You don't have to earn pleasure. Pleasure is for you for every single day. And I want you, if you've heard no other message, I want you to remember that. You deserve pleasure, right? And nobody owes you pleasure. You owe yourself pleasure right? You reclaim that power. It's within you. Pleasure is within you right now. And I want to help you to find presence in your body. We're going to do a meditation together right at the beginning of my workshop to help you just get centered and find presence within yourself. If you have any questions, please do pop it in the comment box. Um, I've got my low battery, so I don't want this to end. I want to be, I want to be sure I can save this. Um, and use the code, if you're going to sign up for my workshop, which is this Thursday, use the code self love to get $10 off. Um, and make sure that you either attend live or catch the recording. It's going to be recorded and I'll send you the recording so that 
just in case you can't make it live, you're able to still um, do the exercises, practice the breath work and the meditation. And honestly, it's gonna be a really beautiful way to practice self-love as well. And so anytime you're feeling low or anytime you're like, I need some stretches and exercises with guidance, you're gonna be able to watch that replay and get connected to yourself. Um, I'm about to wrap things up. So if you have any questions or comments, please do pop it in the comment box. Um, and I just want to say thank you all for attending. Let's just flip through the comments. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much, friends. Hey, Sungi. I'm just wrapping up my IG Live. We went over five reasons why orgasms are weaker, uh, postpartum or, any, or at any time in your life, really. And we're just about to wrap things up. I hope you're all having a great start to your week or I guess what day is it, Tuesday? I'm super pumped about my workshop to reclaim your pleasure on Thursday. That's Thursday, February 23rd from 8.30 to 9.30 p.m. Eastern, Eastern time. Um, for my Aussie friends, that's actually on Friday, Friday afternoon, I believe. Woke up too late. <laughs> that's okay. I don't know what time it is over there. It's, it's almost 4 p.m. over here. So listen, I'm a, I'm a night owl and, I, and I'm not a morning person. So I, I'm with you. But um, yeah, I hope to see all of y'all online at my workshop. We'll stay connected. If you have any questions, I know I've been talking a lot about pleasure the past few weeks, and it's been really interesting, um, you know, to just hear some of the comments. Listen, I'm South, I'm Indian, I'm South Asian. Like, there's a lot of stigma around even talking about this topic in our populations. So I think it's very important, and I think that's why it's really important that that we do talk about it because it's it's the only way to release shame is to actually talk about it. When we hold it within ourselves, whether it's sexual shame or whatever shame it is, body image, that just grows and grows and grows. The shame grows. If we wanna burst that shame, welcome in pleasure, welcome in love, we've gotta focus on the things that help you grow that, right? And that's why I wanna create a space it's not like you're gonna get rid of every shameful belief or you're not gonna just transform your self-image in an hour, but what it's going to do is gonna intentionally create space so that you can focus on the positives, right? Because every other point in our lives, especially I find as new moms, it is so easy to focus on all the bad ways our bodies have changed, all the hardships in our lives, right? I want us to focus our attention on all the good stuff too, because there is a lot of good stuff. And if we start to focus our attention and our energies on some of the, the positives and creating a courageous space where we do, where we love ourselves, even with the added stretch marks or the scars for after a C-section or a birth injury, it does, it can take work to love yourself, especially in a world where it glorifies, in, you know, if it glorifies you if you always look like you're 15, right? or if you're thin, or if you're tall, if you have the typical Eurocentric model of beauty, that that's the problem. It's the false image that we've been sold all our entire lives, right? Most of us don't look like that, or will never look like that, and that's okay, and that is normal. So we're gonna be practicing affirmations and visualizing um, a space where we, where we embrace ourselves as we are. Lots of love to all of you. Have a wonderful Tuesday, or Sungi, for you, it's Wednesday. My gosh, that messes me up as if it's like the next day already. And I hope you, I wish you lots of pleasure and love. Bye.